welcome to Uncommon Sense, where we do our best to make it common again. I'm your host, Adrian Alquist, and I want to say we're joined with another special guest, but I keep saying that. So at a certain point, no one's special. <laughs> so unfortunately, you have to not be the special. Oh, one. dang it. But, but um, I could be the just, extra special guest. You're the extra special guest, yeah. No, but seriously, um, we have an awesome person with us today, Jeremy Darling. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting him you, you last year, right? Yeah. Um, you were performing in the Catholic Young Adults musical. Yeah. Which was really, really fun to watch. It's a blast. Yeah, yeah. Our our mutual friend, uh, Father Kyle Kowalsik, wrote that, and uh, and I I you, I came to you afterwards because you were the lead in the in the musical, and you were explaining to someone about your conversion story. Yeah, and you're like, and and you know they're influential writers like Dale Alquist. I'm like, hey, that's my dad. <laughs> and then you're like, what? <laughs> I did. I I uh, I freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> But but uh, and then we went out for for drinks and food right after the musical, right? It was very Chestertonian. I yeah, thought. yeah. So I that a was my one pun. thing, I, one story I wanted to tell, and uh, <laughs> and yeah, we're well, actually the one other thing I want to say is we're in my, our dad's study, so not my dad's study, Dale Alquist's study right now, because uh, we're still setting up our super studio. jealous. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's why we're not in an official studio room, uh, but but anyway, yeah, that's, that's how I that's how I prefer things. Okay, good, <laughs> good. Uh, but yeah, t- tell tell us about yourself, Jeremy. Jeremy, and uh, yeah. So I am um, I'm a father of four. I've got three sons, and we just had a daughter on Ash Wednesday. I'll get to that story oh, wow. later. I've been married uh, to Gretchen for it'll be 18 years in September. She's the only girlfriend I ever had, and uh, so that's my family life. And I'm an actor and a songwriter here in the uh, in the Twin Cities. So I do film, uh, television, theater, commercial, and print work. <clears throat> That's a big piece of my life. I also started an organization called the Salvage Project back in 2014 in my Protestant days. And the goal was to take music, rid of the good news of the gospel through music into prison shelters, halfway houses, memory care centers, um, uh, to homeless and at-risk youth, people with disabilities, really anyone at the bottom. Uh, anyone that has been kind of left behind by society, I wanted to go and I wanted to sing to them. Music is a very strange way of kind of breaking down boundaries, language barriers. All barriers tend to fall apart in, in the presence of a of a beautiful song. Mm-hmm. And so I've been doing that really now for six years. And I toured in the, the first the, or the preceding three years, probably a third of, of the country, um, often doing eight, nine, ten performances a day. When I was on the road, my goal was to only be on the road since I'm a father. My father worked from home. He was a pastor growing up, and I really wanted to be home from my family as well. So I would only tour three to five days a month. And so we would go into a city. I'd often bring friends with me or ask friends that were in the city that I was going to to join me. And I would just, as many as I could do from the time my, my eyes opened to the time I would collapse, um, I would try and fit in as many different places in the town that I could. So we would reach out at a time. And to a church that I was connected with, I, I at one time had a very big connection to kind of a network of churches around the country. And I would call ahead, where are the shelters, where are the prisons, where are the jails? And oftentimes it was interesting, they didn't know. This was kind of their first time doing something like this. So I would end up reaching out to some of those places and nobody would say no. I mean, a musician wants to come to a woman's shelter and play for free. Like, sure, we would love that. Come Tuesday night. So that was also kind of a big piece of my life. And then in 2015, I, I started working with an organization now called Empower ARC. And they were formerly known as the Abstinence Resource Center. The word abstinence, of course, is not a cool word to bring into schools. Um, but they existed really to bring speakers into schools and encourage children to um, uh, pursue success by postponing sex until marriage. Mm-hmm. So we would talk more really about sexual risk avoidance, but I developed um, kind of a, a performance style lecture on sexuality um, and pornography, human trafficking, all of these things really combined to address, you know, who are we as people? What are we supposed to do with our bodies? And why is this generation in particular struggling so badly? And I mean, you really have to look back at the sexual revolution to understand now why we are here. That is the bloodiest revolution in all of human history that gave us unfettered hardcore pornography, human trafficking, abortion, skyrocketing divorce and fatherless homes, 
Um, I mean, it's profound uh, what it has done to the world and particularly to America. So my goal was to bring you know that into schools, and now I've spoken to probably twenty five thousand kids wow. around the Twin Cities in the last um, couple of years. I got hundreds of letters, uh, handwritten letters from from kids. Um, so that's a big piece of mine. So all in all, I'm kind of a a, a public figure. Mostly, I'm just I'm scratching to make ends meet and, and take care of my family. We have an 11 acre hobby farm now that uh, we got a river and a well and a garden. And a lot of birds. Yeah, that's my chickens great. Wow. died. I had some chickens, but I couldn't keep them alive. <laughs> so I got to try that again. I went through. I had six chickens. I had four that were laying eggs, and like two or three more that were growing up. And um, everything was good. I had this big pen uh, built, but I kept the top open because you know mm. a weasel's not going to jump over that or a wolf, right? Well, I didn't. I didn't know that owls love chicken heads. Do you guys know this? Yeah, no, they eat. No. They eat chicken heads. They will fly in. They'll just rip the head off of a chicken, and they leave the body. It's insane. So one day I was sitting out on my deck and I was praying, and all of a sudden I heard this, <laughs> and I was like, "That doesn't sound good." So I walked down to my garden because I would feed them the scraps in my garden, and two of them were like hiding in the bushes, and they were just staring at these four headless dead chicken bodies, and I was like, "Oh." And then my turkey, I had a turkey. She finally just flew away. She's like, this. <laughs> so I'm still learning. I got some baby chicks, but uh, they all died. Sadly, I put them out. I took them out under the heat lamp, apparently too soon. And they all died in agony. Darn. Got six more <laughs> chicks. terrible. <laughs> got six more after that. And they all contracted some kind of disease that would, one by one, they would just stop moving and tip over and die. And then the next day, one would <laughs> stop moving and tip over and they were all dead. So oh, no. still trying to get my chicken yeah. thing down. I uh, I interviewed Brandon Vaught a couple of weeks ago, and, and he has a farm too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> That's you, awesome. Probably, <laughs> probably uh, go to him with some Yeah, if he uh, hears this, he's going to be yeah. laughing his head off. No, but, but that's my world. Yeah. That's my life. That's great. Yeah. I, I feel like you've lived uh, multiple lives. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you have no yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah, well, well, um, last last week I interviewed Brent Forrest, and he he talked about his uh, journey to Catholicism, yeah. um, and that was what I was interested to hear from you uh, today. And then eventually, maybe uh, maybe next next episode, we'll talk about your life in theater and great. and performing. Sure, How does that sound? That sounds great. I um, so my my journey is fairly recent, and it's it's uh, at least been for me pretty awful. Um, as I, most conversion stories tend to be pretty awful in some way, uh, mm -hmm. for the private yet to hear a story that was like, well, I just was decided to be Catholic and everybody embraced me and loved me and it was all awesome. Yeah. That's not um, how it usually goes. I got, I got to go back to the beginning. So I was, I was born in 1981 in Ames, Iowa to Mark and Kathy Darling to this day, the two greatest Christians I've ever met in my life. Uh, in abject poverty, we lived uh, below the poverty line in a, in a little trailer park there in Ames. And I only re remember being happy and being loved. Um, and that's really a testament to my parents' faith and their devotion and their their diligence in not letting their circumstances get the best of them in their marriage. It was not easy for my mom uh, at the time being married to my dad. He was a, a recent uh, convert to Christianity himself and had a lot of issues to work out. My dad, I've never met anybody that does this in the Protestant world, but he would go out for hours in the woods just sobbing and begging God to change him. It was really his confession of and that is probably maybe 90% of the reason my dad is who he is today and uh, why my had it's really a charmed childhood in spite of all the financial difficulties. So we moved up to uh, Minnesota in 1986. My dad was ordained as a pastor, and he started um, some churches up here, non-denominational church. Really, the, the goal, the heart of our churches was to, to be Bible-based and not tied to any denomination. Um, and that they really did that well, as well as they could in, in, I think the limited scope of, of that expression of Christianity, they did a tremendous job and we became part of kind of the seeker church movement in, in the nineties. And if you're not familiar with that term, it really was designed to bring people in, unchurched people in to hear the gospel. That was really our, our goal. And they, for all intents and purposes, they did a tremendous job at that. It was really a wonderful outreach. So I was raised in, you know, from diapers, from the moment I was breathing air, um, up until about two years ago in that in that world. And there was a lot of beauty there. I've worked very hard as I've 
come into my conversion, um, to leave behind things that were hard for me or that were hurtful and just look back in gratitude. I learned from Richard John Newhouse, who was a Lutheran minister for 30 years before he converted to Catholicism, um, that that's, that's the best and safest way to go. The only regrets I have are my own shortcomings um, during those, those years. So in 1999, I was 17, and we, along with my dad and uh, my older sister and some uh, singles from our church, we started a new church um, in uptown Minneapolis designed, again, to reach the unchurched. But uptown at that time in the late 90s was the place where all the people went that were Wiccan and Satanists mm -hmm. and piercings and buttless jeans. There were people walking around uptown at that time in buttless jeans. Wow. It was a crazy time in uptown. And that's where we went. We want to go. They need Jesus. That's where we're going to go. And uh, it was probably only two months after we opened our doors in January of 99 that I met the woman that I would marry. Uh, my wife came very broken. Um, her high school experience, I mean, was pretty charmed from the outside, but she was a heavy drinker. She drove drunk 15, 20 times in high school. Um, she was raped when she was 16. Um, a lot of issues common to any pretty girl in the mid-90s. So she came to the rock ready at the bottom, and uh, my dad was doing a series. The pastors, in, if, if you're not familiar with the Protestant expression, you know, there's a, there's a lot of music. I was on the music team and eventually became their, their worship leader. And then there's about a 45-minute message. And my dad was doing a series called Overcoming Broken Relationships, which would go down as one of the most probably important things my dad has done. And that's what really caught my wife's heart. And she gave her life to Christ and was baptized um, in our church. I actually was the one that, that, that baptized her. We very quickly became best friends, which was new for me. I'd never had a, a best friend. I didn't have a lot of friends growing up. Hmm. And it was later that fall, we, my dad kind of forced us to acknowledge, like, you guys like each other, right? <laughs> and um, I would have married her pretty quickly after that, even I was only freshly 18. Um, but we, we ran into just a mountain, uh, just a mountain of, of trials that I was kind of expecting. I mean, you're never really prepared for like the worst things to happen to you. But it was good to see my wife's response, you know, newly minted as a Christian. Um, her response was just tremendous. Uh, amidst a lot of persecution over our relationship and her, her life, newfound life in Christ. So we ended up getting married in 2002 and kind of started our, our life together. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of really, really that our marriage kind of christened the moment when all of the worst things ever would just be poured out um, on our heads. So my sister ended up getting very sick for about six years, very sick. My little sister, I have a younger brother, a younger sister and an older sister. So my younger sister got very sick and there were just a lot of health problems around our family. I mean, our just turned upside down. And we didn't end up getting pregnant with our first child until 2009, which was the worst at the time, the worst year. Yeah, right after the crash, right? Yeah, um, but we ended up, my sister was basically dying. She was sent home from Mayo to die. They couldn't wow. fix her. And they had treated my family very bad at the Mayo Clinic. Um, in a whole series of just miraculous events, um, my sister got well. We had our baby in October of 2009, and that was kind of the turning point. Um, it was, I mean, uh, he was, Wyatt, my oldest, was really kind of our miracle baby. So we're trying to kind of rebuild a life, and, and our family kind of trying to come back together after this intense, intense, life-changing trial that we, honestly, I just try not to talk about anymore. Um, had our second child in 2012, another mountain of trials followed that. And then our third child came in uh, 2016, another mount of trials. Uh, my kids just seem to bring like, they either come at like the cusp of a trial or like the beginning of a trial. Yeah. And, you know, just living life, uh, doing the rock. I was, I'd started a ministry at the rock called Ever Island. And um, I was ministering to uh, homeless and at-risk youth. We were doing music concerts every week. And it was, uh, it was a beautiful thing. Then, um, it was the end of 2017, and there was just kind of this wave of uh, the, the Me Too movement really exploded. And I had this really strange sense that, you know, I think this is all a ruse. 
I think this is being done not to expose the bad guys, but to try and frame the good guys. <clears throat> and it was January, it was like December 31st or January 1st, I, I emailed, um, that was maybe the end of January, I emailed a bunch of friends. I said, guys, they're coming for us. They're coming for the, for the, the Christian men that have loved their families, loved their wives. Um, this is sort of Joseph. I felt like this scenario of Joseph back in the Old Testament mm -hmm. was, was really coming for every man. So I said, I think we got to lawyer up. I, I have a prepaid legal service uh, that I pay for. It's my whole family's covered, and I get 60 hours of in trial uh, legal defense. And if someone should, you know, falsely accuse me, I, I, I have some legal recourse here. Mm -hmm. And five days later, five days, um, someone out of nowhere that we hadn't seen in years um, made an accusation against my father on, on Twitter. And literally, literally within one month, everything was gone. Everything. Our, our, our churches um, decided against all reason, even though they knew my father was innocent, to launch an investigation. Uh, like a, almost like a fake one to, to sort of show the world that, you know, we care and we're listening, but we know, we know your dad's innocent. We're just going to do this fake investigation. And it imploded. Uh, if my father, it took years off his life and my mother, what, what was done to them, not, the lie, the lie was a little thing, ironically, but it was the church's um, botched response that destroyed everything I just took everything from us. I lost all of my friends, all but like a like a, a, a handful. Wow. Men that I'd known 20 years just could not, were incapable of, of defending my dad, of saying anything. Everybody just seemed completely terrified. And uh, many of the men, you know, that I don't even know anymore, that I'd known all my life, the word they used was paralyzed. I'm just paralyzed. I'm like, I know, I know exactly what to do. He's an innocent man. You, you stand up. Why is that so hard to get your head around? So March came around to 2018, and I sat down with some of the leaders. I said, look, guys, you've got a week to figure this out. If you don't, I'm, I'm, I'm going to war for my father. I die for my father. And I hope someday somebody would do this for me. So that's what happened. And uh, I released um, uh, an essay called The Reckoning, seven pages, just an evisceration of both the lie and uh, building up of my father's life. And uh, that really, that launched a war. It was Most of it was online, but it cost me everything. And so by the, by the middle of the summer, um, it was all gone. It was all burned to the ground, everything in six months. And our family was left reeling with almost no support, going, what did we miss? I mean, this has been our entire life. Our entire existence has been this this experience this church and i had quietly just been been wondering you know maybe house church is what we should have been doing that's about all i can find in the bible i mean truly i can't open the bible and find a worship leader or a 45 minute sermon or sunday school or baby dedications like we were doing or any i mean any of the stuff that we did i couldn't find in the bible that doesn't make it wrong it was just interesting to me for for an expression of christianity that was so Bible based, I couldn't find even my role in the church as a worship leader and a house church leader and small group leader and all of these things. And I had really, over the years, been very disillusioned even with my own role because it had brought me either fame and notoriety or it was completely ostracized. Um, I was either idolized or ostracized because here you got this guy in the center of the stage doing music. It's kind of a natural thing. And I didn't know any other way to do church. I just felt like if I can be humble and and kind of keep my head low about it, then I, I, this is what you're supposed to do. So at the end of December 2018, my little brother um, said, I, I need to talk to you. So he brought me over to his house one night in his basement. And to make a very long story short, he basically pulled out this book called the Didache and read a couple of passages, not least of which was they were confessing before receiving the Eucharist. And I was like, huh, that's, and he's like, this book predates like some of the books of the Bible. Then he, he introduced me to some of these guys called the Church Fathers. I didn't know two things I didn't know following Christ since I was five. What happened after the apostles died? No clue. Mm -hmm. There's like blackness, and then Billy Graham was born. That's about all I knew. 
And when did the Bible become a book called the Bible? I, if you had asked me two and a half years ago, when did the Bible become the Bible? I would have had no idea. The Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. I, I don't <laughs> just, mean it. Yeah. You know, the, just the letter sometime, I guess, after the letters were written. So the answers, you cannot, as an honest Protestant, dig into those two answers and not have some really serious choices ahead of you. But I knew in five minutes. My, my brother just shared those two things. I knew in five minutes. Oh. We're supposed to be Catholic. That's what I missed. And I walked out of that night converted. I knew, oh, I can't just, I need to be able to like defend some of their doctrines and dogmas. Otherwise, I'm going to look like an idiot. So I thought, well, I got to read some books. And my brother gave me a book by Steve Ray called Crossing the Tiber. That was my first big introduction to the church fathers. And really, it was showing that from scripture to the apostles to the next 500 years of Christianity, there was a general consensus on baptism as the ordinary means of the forgiveness of sins and on, on the Eucharist. And that there was one long continuity from Scripture to the Church Fathers on those two things. I, that was, I mean, that was it. So the next step was, well, I need some history. I mean, a philosophical history to understand this. And I don't remember how, or it was probably my brother again that said, you should read The Everlasting Man by G.K. Chesterton. And I'll quote C.S. Lewis. I was not an atheist, but you know, C.S. Lewis, uh, I think, mentioned that book as part of his conversion. Uh, a young atheist cannot be too careful about what he reads. And that's probably true, true for a, a young Protestant. Yeah. Um, that really gave me the fill in all the philosophical gaps. It was, to this day, the most profound book I've ever read on Christianity as the philosophical answer to man's great and deep needs and what i noticed of course uh, we looked this up just before we we started but the word catholics only mentioned about 42 times in all of that you know book so you could read it probably as a protestant and kind of overlook some of those things right, and yeah. recognize this 2000 year unbroken chain that's what my my dad basically did i mean that was his first chesterton book that he read and oh, really was, yeah you know, yeah he read it on his honeymoon <laughs> 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 Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, what are you reading a book on your honeymoon? Yeah, that, that's a story. For <laughs> I, I gotta but talk yeah. to your dad about that. Yeah, yeah. I started with that one. My actually, my brother he gave me a list, and I wanted to read Chesterton post conversion first, because I wanted to see where he ended up. After the Everlasting Man, I went back to Orthodoxy, which was a little headier, but equally as important um, to see the the. I had no orthodoxy in my Christian expression. Well, you know, maybe like 1% of my expression. Now, that is not to say that my parents raised me wrong or or did anything wrong. What I've told anybody is, you know, it's not like I came from Mormonism to Catholicism or atheism to Catholicism or Jehovah's Witness to Catholicism. You know, I believe I believe there are serious errors there. And I wouldn't even put the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses in a Protestant column. What I've what I've told people is that I was incomplete, but loving Jesus Christ as best I could with an incomplete picture. Now I have come into the fullness, the completeness, and I can spend the rest of my life learning about that. I've stepped into the flow of of Christian history. Uh, is the most profound thing that has ever happened to me um, in my life, and, and Chesterton was right there at the beginning. So after orthodoxy and the everlasting man i dove into um the thing why i am a catholic it started as an essay then became a book right and i mean i'm literally just sitting there like every page and finally i was like why am i underlining it? <laughs> yeah the that, whole book's gonna be one. underlined <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that that to me even even at that time the 1930s you know, could really see the stamp of of anti-catholic hate among the protestant world and chesterton just deftly handled all of it i can almost picture him it seems like often he was writing going why hasn't anybody said this <laughs> i know i know there's a lot of yeah. that that flavor in it but one of the things really struck me because this is what's been hard for many people in my world to understand is it just catholicism just seems like so much there's just so much to learn and and, and he made this great point that nothing god made is simple I make a pick a blade of grass outside right now and, and the cells and molecules and, molecules and, and particles and 
whatever those are that make up that blade of grass is unbelievably beyond the complexity that my mind could even process. It's like the closer you, know, you look, uh, there's there's more to discover. Just correct. Like a, a mystery that we so, talked about. That correct. Catholicism in that sense is the microscope mm-hmm. um, to Christianity. And and I learning to love God with all of my mind, not just my heart and my soul and my strength, but to love him with my mind. That's what I felt I had been missing um, for, for my Christian life. So I... I got through all of that Chesterton piece, and then I dove into probably 60 more books. I probably read 60-plus books in the last year and a half, mostly over Audible. I'm doing this in the car late at night. I've got a family. And hundreds of essays between the Catholic thing and First Things, two sites I've really cherished. And then, of course, the other, probably the only other guy that comes close to Chesterton in terms of explaining the faith and, and the paradox of Christianity is Fulton Sheen. Mm-hmm. And I went through his <laughs> yeah. catechism and a lot of his uh, writings as well. So I compiled all of my thoughts into an essay called Becoming Catholic. Uh, it's up at becomingcatholic.faith. And really it's just kind of an amalgamation of what I struggled with before, what I found in Catholicism. But as opposed to me just pontificating, I, I really felt like Catholics deserve a right to speak for themselves. My father was denied a voice. He was falsely accused. He was denied a chance to defend himself. And that's often what Protestants will do to Catholics. We speak for them. We spoke for them. Catholics believe this or that. But if you really talk to a priest or an apologist or a Fulton Sheen, let them explain the faith. Suddenly it made exponentially more sense than what I had been practicing. So my my essay at becomingcatholic.faith is my thoughts on, on confession, followed by some quotes from Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, and Tolkien, because these brilliant men... Well, Lewis was Anglican, <laughs> which is functionally Catholic. And if you read Sheldon Van Aken's book, A Severe Mercy, which is a friendship with Lewis, Sheldon later became Catholic, and Lewis would have as well, um, had, he, had he not uh, died. Um, Lord have mercy. Um, so when I realized these brilliant men were Catholic, I, what am I supposed I'm going to sit in front of Chesterton and be like, well, don't you know that Catholics, you know, they lick Mary's toes. What do you say about that? I mean, it's just, yeah, these are yeah. brilliant men. And you don't have to be brilliant. You can be the dumbest guy, right? You could be a Peter, a St. Peter. It doesn't matter. You don't have to read all these books. You know, I, I get that. But for me, I just couldn't stop. I felt like I'd found a gold mine. Why would I stop? I mean, I found this this vein of gold that just gets bigger as I dig. So uh, I finished the essay and earlier in the year, I began kind of sending out to my family and and quietly kind of making my entrance into the publicly into the catholic so this is my first time telling a yeah. very short painfully short version yeah, of that well, story we're honored yeah i mean and you're kind of doing my job for me because i'm the director of evangelization so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, anything i can do to help bro thank you for watching and thank you for being with us jeremy uh we'll we'll put your website in in our description if awesome. you're watching this on youtube and uh please follow us on on instagram we are at nine thousand nine hundred followers so we're almost at ten thousand which is a big benchmark that's pretty exciting yeah i know yeah but until next time help us to make uncommon sense more common see ya